Howdy folks, it's me, Josh. For those of you who haven't been keeping up with my updates in the community tab and in my Discord, I just recently went on a vacation over to Spain and Portugal. It was a very interesting trip and I learned a lot of cool things that I'd never known about before. But the most interesting thing that stood out the most to me was something that I was surprised I knew next to nothing about. Or rather, someone. So, it's the 1930s and Europe is a pretty turbulent place. World War I had rocked nearly the entire continent and the Great Depression had destroyed economies everywhere. And so, people decided they needed change and a new wave of authoritarianism was brought about. We saw the rise of people like Hitler and Mussolini in their fascist movement and those such as Franco and Engelbert Dollfuss bringing their nations back to the church. But today, we're not talking about any of these people. We're talking about a man who rose to power in much the same way moved for longer than anyone else, was instrumental in the politics of the day, and was nearly forgotten. Antonio de Oliveira Salazar was born in Santa Combadal, Portugal, on April 28, 1889, which was actually exactly eight days after Hitler. What are the odds? If there was one thing you needed to know about him, it was that he was very Catholic, even from a young age. When he was 11, he began going to a seminary school and actually considered becoming a priest. As he grew, he ended up going to the University of Coimbra in order to study finance and eventually would graduate with a doctorate in economic policy, something that would eventually carry him very far. Portugal at this point was an absolute mess, but in order to understand this mess, we're going to need to take a couple steps back to the late 19th century. At this point, the Portuguese Empire was very clearly in decline, and just like in every case like this, the one person that people loved to blame was the king. A man named Carlos Fernando Luis Maria Victor Miguel Rafael Gabriel Gonzaga Xavier Francisco de Assis José Simão e Braganza, or Carlos for short. In 1890, it was under King Carlos that Portugal faced international humiliation as Portugal immediately yielded to an ultimatum from the British, forcing them to withdraw from the territory in between their colonies of Mozambique and Angola in what's today Zimbabwe and Zambia. And in Brazil, Portugal's former colony, with whom they were very closely economically linked, after the death of Emperor Pedro II, the monarchy fell, causing economic collapse in Portugal, which the monarchy wasn't able to respond well to. All of this would lead to the rise of the Portuguese Republican movement, whose ideology was not just inspired by a hatred of the monarchy, but was also inspired by French Jacobinism and a sheer hatred of Christianity and the Catholic Church, which they described as their number one enemy as they sought a revolution similar to the French Revolution. And so, all of this would culminate when, in 1908, King Carlos and Crown Prince Luis Felipe were shot and killed in what would be known as the Lisbon Regicide. Thankfully, Carlos' second son, a young man named Manuel Maria Felipe Carlos Emilio Luis Miguel Rafael Gabriel Gonzaga Francisco de Assis Eugenio de Sexa Corbogo Gota e Braganza, or Manuel for short, managed to survive and would be crowned as King Manuel II the Patriot when he was only 18 years old. Manuel did his best to try to pick up the pieces of the monarchy, but at this point, it was too late, and in 1910, revolution broke out, which would result in him being deposed and the creation of the Portuguese First Republic. Now, if there's one thing you need to know about the Republic, it's that they hated Catholics. Their rule could only really be described as a state of anarcho-tyranny, as the country was in a near constant state of revolution, but yet they still managed to persecute Catholics en masse in a Catholic nation. So if their goal was to have a revolution like the French Revolution, I guess they succeeded. Salazar was only 21 while all of this was happening, and was absolutely horrified. Though not a monarchist, he could only look on in horror to see what the Republic had done and the chaos they had caused. Salazar began to get involved in Catholic organizations and eventually started dabbling in politics as well, knowing that something had to be done about this anti-Christian regime. In 1921, he reluctantly decided to run for parliament, 
one, appeared in chamber once, and then immediately quit after realizing just how much complete individualism had corrupted the political process. The Republic would last about five more years until eventually, the military decided that enough was enough and overthrew the government in 1926, creating a military dictatorship. After the military took power, Salazar used his economic expertise to gain a position in the new regime, being appointed as Minister of Finance. The dictatorship was still turbulent, however, and grew divided into two main factions, being the military officers and the National Catholics, which had come to be represented by Salazar. By 1932, the regime still hadn't produced a clear leader. However, this would change when, on July 5th, 1932, Salazar was appointed as Prime Minister, and by 1933, Salazar had drafted a new constitution which he held a referendum on. The referendum was easily passed and Salazar reorganized Portugal into what would be known as the Estado Novo, or New State, with himself at its center. Now, if there's one thing that I really want to make clear about the Estado Novo, it's that it was not fascist. Sure, it was authoritarian, but Salazar did just about everything he could do to distance himself from fascism, which he himself described as pagan Caesarism. The Estado Novo is much more commonly associated with his contemporary regime in Austria under Engelbert Dollfuss, as they both put the church at its core, not a party. In fact, when it came to governing the country, Salazar generally took a back seat and let the church do most of the work when it came to social issues. After the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, Salazar gave a great amount of aid to Franco and the Nationalists, fearing what would happen if a communist nation ended up right on his border. And eventually, the two nations would sign the Iberian Pact, which would make them even closer as economic and diplomatic partners. And speaking of diplomacy, Salazar was one of the only European leaders that managed to accurately predict the outcome of World War II when the war first broke out, saying that Britain would suffer but remain undefeated until the US joined the war, helping to win the war for the Allies. However, despite this, he still knew that if Portugal were to join the war, they would still suffer heavy attacks and devastation no matter which side they joined. And so, Salazar did everything he could to make sure that both Portugal and Spain stayed neutral in the war, which would ultimately be of great benefit to Portugal as, after the war, his regime, alongside Franco's, managed to stay intact. However, unlike Franco, Salazar's Portugal was accepted under the Marshall Plan, allowing their economy to boom even greater than it already was. In 1949, Portugal would end up becoming one of the founding members of NATO, a core member of the Western Bloc against Communism. At this point, Salazar knew that in the post-war era he would have to start liberalizing Portugal a bit, starting to loosen up on some restrictions, though still keeping his regime firmly authoritarian. However, in stark contrast, while the rest of Europe began their decolonization process, Salazar, remembering the catastrophe that led to the downfall of King Carlos, remained adamant that Portugal keep a firm grip on its colonies, particularly Angola and Mozambique, which Portugal would hold on to until the end of his regime. In 1968, though, Salazar suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and went into a coma. Unfit to rule, Salazar was removed from power and was succeeded by a man named Marcelo Caetano. Two years later, on July 27, 1970, Salazar died. And four years later, so would his regime, as what would come to be known as the Carnation Revolution toppled his government. Under his rule, education improved, literacy exploded, and the economy boomed. But most importantly, Salazar managed to take an unstable and collapsing Portugal that persecuted its primary religion and turned it into a wealthy, stable, and religious nation. In 1936, Pope Pius XII said of him, I bless him with all my heart, and I cherish the most ardent desire that he may be able to complete successfully his work of national restoration, both spiritual and material. However, despite all of the great things he did for his nation, we outside Portugal barely even remember him. Salazar was a ruler and a dictator just like all the rest in Europe at the time, and even though his regime managed to exist for longer than any of his contemporaries, he was still outshadowed by them in nearly every way. 
He made his country a deeply Catholic nation, but Dolfus did that too. His regime managed to survive the end of World War II and stick around until the 70s, but so did Franco's. And so Salazar stands as Europe's forgotten dictator. So thanks for watching today's video. If you liked it, make sure to stick around for more. And hey, you could also maybe subscribe or something. So that's it for today's video. Well, till next time, see ya.